Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the first year of the medical course in physiology, you are taught the hemodynamic principles of our circulation and the internal milieu. In pathology, we will be taking a series of lectures and in this you will see what can go wrong in that hemodynamic circulation and the internal milieu. In today's class, we will look at a particular entity called edema. By the end of this class, you should be able to define edema, explain the pathophysiological mechanisms that result in the formation of edema and know the basic types of edema. But before going into these concepts, we first need to review a few general principles in the physiology of the water distribution in our bodies. Now, in an average 70 kg gentleman, you find that 42 liters is constituted by water that is about 50 per 57 percent of the body volume. Now, in this individual of the 42 liters of water, we find that it is distributed into different compartments. A large bulk of this fluid is stored in the intracellular compartment. Twenty-eight liters. The rest of it is in the extracellular compartment, about 14 liters. The extracellular compartment is again subdivided into the interstitial compartment and the intravascular compartment. 10.5 liters of fluid is in the interstitial compartment. This is between the cells and the intravascular compartment that is the flowing blood has about 3 liters of water. In our bodies, there is a constant movement of fluid at the level of the microcirculation between these 3 compartments that is the intravascular, the interstitial and the intracellular compartments. Fluids move out at the microcirculation and move back in into the venous end of the circulation. This movement of fluid in the various compartments is determined by two basic pressures. The fluid itself determines what is called as the hydrostatic pressure. However, in each of these compartments, there is also solutes which are dissolved, which add to another pressure called the colloid osmotic pressure. Now, in each of these compartments, you will find that there is a specific colloid which contributes to the colloid osmotic pressure. The interstitial compartment colloid osmotic pressure is determined by the dissolved sodium in the water in that compartment. The intravascular fluid also determines gets some of its osmotic pressure from the sodium in it, but the albumin that is dissolved in it adds another 20 millimeters of mercury to the pressure. So, the albumin is actually the one which determines the pressure of the intravascular compartment. The intracellular compartment, the oncotic pressure is determined by the dissolved potassium. Now, when it comes to the movement of fluids into and out of the vascular compartment and into the interstitial compartment, these forces that is the hydrostatic pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure follow the Starling's law. If the ratio of the osmotic pressure of the intracellular to the interstitial compartment sorry the intravascular to the interstitial compartment falls 
or if the difference between the hydrostatic pressure between the intravascular and the interstitial compartment increases, then water moves from the intravascular into the interstitial compartment. If the hydrostatic pressure within the vascular compartment increases, it forces fluid out into the interstitial compartment. Similarly, if the colloid osmotic pressure decreases, it forces fluid into the sorry into the interstitial compartment. Now, when we go to the microcirculation level, there is about 32 millimeters of pressure exerted by the hydrostatic comp component in the intravascular compartment. The interstitial hydrostatic pressure is about 3 millimeters. So, a net 14 ml of per minute of fluid moves out from the intravascular into the interstitial compartment. Now, as this fluid moves towards the venous end of the microcirculation, because of the fluid moving out of the vasculature, the colloid osmotic pressure progressively increases because the concentration of the solutes goes up. Remember that the capillary walls are selectively permeable and do not allow albumin to move out into the interstitial compartment. Because the osmotic pressure is higher than the hydrostatic pressure in the venous end, it draws back the fluid that has escaped into the interstitium into the intravascular compartment. Approximately 12 ml per minute migrates back into the vascular compartment. Now, you will see that there is a net 2 ml of fluid that is existing in the interstitial compartment. If this increased fluid is allowed to accumulate, this compartment will have an excess of fluid, but that does not happen normally because this excess fluid is drained off by the lymphatics present in the microcirculation. Hence, no net gain of fluid is seen in the interstitial compartment in normal individuals. So, in spite of fluid constantly moving between the compartments, you will find that there is an equilibrium maintained between these three compartments, the intravascular, the interstitial and the intracellular compartment. This maintenance of equilibrium in the internal environment is what you learnt is homeostasis. How then does an excess of fluid accumulate in the interstitial compartment and what is it called? This excess of fluid accumulating in the interstitial compartment is known as edema. It can occur ac accumulate either in the interstitium or in the body cavities and it is derived from a Greek word which means swelling. If the fluid accumulates in the body cavities, it gets different names. For example, fluid accumulating in the peritoneal cavity is referred to as ascites. Similarly, fluid accumulating in the thoracic or pleural cavity is known as hydrothorax. In the peritoneal cavity is hydroperitoneum and hydropericardium if the fluid accumulates in the pericardial cavity. This fluid which is accumulating in body cavities is also sometimes called effusion. As a result, we refer to it as pleural effusion, pericardial effusion and peritoneal effusion depending on which cavity is involved by this process. Now, how does excess fluid accumulate in the interstitial compartment? It is very simple if you understood the simple physiological mechanisms. We said that hydrostatic pressure drives fluid out of the blood vessel into the interstitial compartment. For some reason, if the hydrostatic pressure within the vessels increases, you will find that more fluid will go into the interstitial compartment. We said that a drop in colloid osmotic pressure in the vessels normally would allow fluid to move out of the vessels. So, a higher increase in the drop will cause more fluid to move into the interstitial compartment. For example, we said that albumin is present in the intravascular compartment. So, if albumin is lost from the circulation, say through the urine, 
then there is hypoalbuminemia and that would cause a drop in the colloid osmotic pressure within the blood vessels and an increased migration of fluid into the interstitial compartment resulting in edema. The third is if that 2 ml per minute is not drained off by patent lymphatic channels, then too there will be a net accumulation in the interstitial compartment. This thus lymphatic obstruction also results in edema. Sodium is the solute which is present in the interstitial fluid determining its colloid osmotic pressure. Hence, any condition that causes retention of sodium and therefore, water secondarily in the interstitium will result in edema. This happens in renal diseases where sodium is not excreted through the glomerular filtrate and therefore, homes in to the interstitium dragging water along with it. Last but not the least is increased vascular permeability. Whenever gaps develop between the endothelial cells as you have seen in inflammation, it is not only the fluid, but also the cells and the proteins that escape into the interstitial compartment. And this is the swelling that you see in inflammatory conditions and it is usually formed because of an exudate. In the first four conditions, where the semi permeable capillary membrane does not allow the movement of the form components of blood, you find mainly fluid moving out. Hence, in the first four situations, the fluid collecting in the interstitium is a transudate, whereas in inflammation, it is an exudate. Having now seen the basic mechanisms by which excess fluids accumulate in the interstitium, we will now look at the different types of edema that are seen in the clinical scenario. We have three types of classification. The first is the localized or generalized edema. Localized edema means that one particular organ or tissue is involved by edema. For example, if there is edema involving the lungs alone, we call it pulmonary edema. Generalized edema on the contrary means that number of tissues or the whole body is involved by the process. The other terms to describe generalized edema are anasaka and kwashiorkor and this can be seen when there is protein, energy, malnutrition which you might have seen in pediatric patients. Clinically, the clinician on seeing edema usually puts firm pressure with a finger against a bony surface to see whether a pit forms or not. If a pit forms, it is called pitting edema, whereas if a pit does not form, it is referred to as non-pitting edema. Usually in cardiac failure, we find pitting edema, whereas in filariasis, we see that it is a non-pitting edema. The last type is the non-inflammatory and the inflammatory edema. Non-inflammatory edema is seen in cardiac, renal and hepatic failure, whereas the inflammatory edema is seen in acute inflammatory processes like for example, an abscess formation. So, today we have seen that edema means increased fluid accumulation in the interstitial compartment and this is brought about by increased hydrostatic pressure in the vascular compartment, decreased colloid osmotic pressure in the vascular compartment, lymphatic obstruction, retention of sodium and water in the interstitial compartment and increased vascular permeability. Thank you.